This episode of AmateurLogic.tv is brought to you by Gigaparts.com, the amateur radio online superstore. Use the promo code ALTVAPRIL to receive a free gift with your order. MFJ, the world leaders in ham radio accessories at MFJEnterprises.com and by ICOM. Spring is here and it's time to take ham radio on the road. Take ICOM with you en route, on location, and on the go. Hi, welcome to AmateurLogic.tv, episode 53. I'm George. I'm Tommy. And I'm Peter. And it's great to be back with you here in the middle of April. Boy, what's that yellow stuff out there, Tommy? Man, it is pollen. It is just covering everything. It is, I swear. Well, what have you got for us this time, Tommy? Well, you know, we've had some requests about how we put AmateurLogic.tv together, and I got a little behind-the-scenes footage this time. Cool. What about you, Peter? Well, uh, in my recent trip to uh, New South Wales, I stopped off at Tidbinbilla. We're going to have a look at that. And I'm going to be answering the question, can you really run PSK31 on a Raspberry Pi? And we'll know the answer to that here shortly. Well, let's get on into the show. Uh, Peter, what have people been writing you about this month? My first uh, email or letter is um, from Leon, VK3VGA. And he says he'd like to share with other hams a great and easy method to make ladder line feeder. He used heavy duty speaker wire, micro sprinkler extension tubes as spacers, 50 millimeters long, and thin cable ties to fasten the wire to the spacer tubes. And yeah, it's a great idea there, Leo. Yeah, it is. And uh, that's spaced a little further apart than the ladder line you buy, but. I bet it works out pretty good. And we've got a special announcement coming up later in the show. I, I wanted to mention that. We'll be uh, talking about that a little later. It's going to be pretty nice. I bet some folks have already figured out maybe what it's going to be. But uh, Yeah, don't let the props throw yeah, you. Yeah, don't let the props throw you. <laughs> well, Tommy, have you got one over there? Yeah, I do. I've got one from my friend Jeff, AC2JB. And uh, he sends in... That uh, suggestion, when showing a kit build or rig review, please put a fixed banner of text on the bottom of the screen. Uh, that way you can remember to write down the URL and go reference it later. Well, we already do that, don't we, Tommy? Yeah, we do. We've been putting those on there for quite a while. And uh, in addition to that, you can go over to the wiki now. We've got show notes that typically put the URLs in there as well. Yeah, that's amateurlogic.tv slash wiki, and uh, our friend Dan does that, and... Yeah, if you want to know what we're talking about in an episode and you don't want to watch the whole thing again, just go check it out on the wiki. Otherwise, maybe you need to adjust your monitor where you can see the, the lower third on there because we usually do put that in there. I won't say we never slip up. but Yeah, it's possible we could have missed one, but typically they're, they're there. Um. Well, guys, you know, I was over at uh, Huntsville uh, for the last show. It was, you know, the extra show we just put out at the uh, end of March. And had a great time over there at Gigaparts. Let's take a look at what they're showing us this month. The ICOM IC7200 is the perfect combination of advanced digital features and ease of use. Out of the box, the IC7200's digital filters give you the ability to change filter shape and width without having to buy additional filters. Only ICOM has digital twin passband tuning with dedicated control knobs to easily shift and narrow the IF passband until the interference is gone and you can clearly hear that weak signal. The IC7200 is ruggedly built and compact, perfect for portable operations in the field and also ideal for occupying minimal space in your shack. Only a USB cable is required to connect the IC7200 to a PC instead of a bunch of messy interface cables. Get yours with a unique paint job. 
IC7200s are now available in multicam, digital camo, olive drab, safety orange, and even pink. Only from Gigaparts. Gigaparts is the largest independent amateur radio dealer in the nation. Everything you need for ham radio, including books, DVDs, antennas, rope, coax, and tuners. Gigaparts has it all and is open Monday through Saturday. Call us toll free at 866 535 4442, and our friendly staff will be happy to help you find the right products for nearly any project and budget. Online shopping made easy with real time pricing and availability, and free shipping on most orders. Go to gigaparts.com and enter to win a free radio. Have a question? Click on live chat for a quick answer. Low prices, huge selection. America's favorite ham radio store is Gigaparts. When you place your order, use the code ALTVAPRIL and get a free gift with your order. And uh, you've got my my interest kind of peaked. I'm curious, does PSK31 work with the Raspberry Pi? That is a good question. Let's take a look and see. You know, your friends here at Amateur Logic like the Raspberry Pi, and uh, we've all got one and been playing with them for a while. But we've yet to find just a super good ham radio use for them. A lot of our viewers keep asking, can you run PSK31 on a Raspberry Pi? And most of the interest seems to point toward FL Digi, a nice PSK31 program for Linux a lot of people use. Unfortunately, I can't find any information where people have been having good success with running it on a Raspberry Pi. It seems the program is just a little too processor intensive for the current Raspberry Pis and just doesn't work well. However, I did find some information on another program called Lin PSK that supposedly does work on the Raspberry Pi, and that's what we're going to try today. Now, I'm not going to show you all the steps necessary to install Lin PSK on your Raspberry Pi. Because there is an excellent website already, it's a slice of raspberrypi.blogspot.com, where all the details have been listed in blog posts to help you get it up and running. I'm using the original Raspberry Pi Model B with 256 megabytes of RAM and the Raspi operating system. For the sound device, you can't use the sound that's built into the Raspberry Pi because it only has playback. There's no record. So, I'm using an external USB device. It's a Sound Blaster X5 Go. Now, this would probably work just as well with a cheaper USB sound device. However, I just used what I could find locally. Now, I started out with receiving a lot of garble, and finally I got things tweaked where I was receiving meaningful data. This seemed to be dependent upon the signal I was receiving and the level of the mic input on the sound card. I used the Alsa mixer to reduce the level down fairly low and the signal started decoding much better. Now a word of caution here, you need to put that sound device on a USB port by itself. Don't connect it to a hub along with your keyboard and mouse unless you want problems. The signals won't decode and your mouse and keyboard will be very unresponsive. Once I had things tweaked in to where I was satisfied with the receive quality I was getting, I started thinking about transmitting. The Raspberry Pi does not have a serial port. You can use a USB serial port with it, however, the one I had did not work, so I decided that I would try putting my rig in Vox. I fed my audio into the microphone input of the rig, and then engaged the Vox. The moment of truth had arrived, so I had set up a couple of macros to save time typing text. I clicked the transmit button, and you can see it's sending a CQ from me and identifying myself as using a Raspberry Pi in case someone was interested. I go back to the receive mode now, and we'll listen and see if anybody replies. Almost immediately, someone started typing my call letters in. And there's a little garble in there, too. His signal is fairly low, but it's N9ZQA, and he's operating QRP, which may explain why we don't have a good copy here. I don't have the squelch adequately set, so you'll see garbage coming on the screen in between transmissions. 
and now I'm going to reply to him, and we'll see if we can get a QSO started. I tell him thanks for the call and that I'm operating uh, with Lynn PSK on a Raspberry Pi computer. And I want to know a little bit about how he's receiving me. And he reports back that he's got me 599, which is uh, excellent. Uh, almost 100% except some QSB and fading problems, but that would be typical. I was wondering if anyone would know what a Raspberry Pi was on here, and apparently this is what caught his attention, he says. Uh, he received one recently, uh, but hadn't done anything with it yet. So I was glad to run up on somebody who actually knew what it was for the first QSO. He also said he had been trying to come up with some type of ham radio application for it. And then back to me. I told him that this is the first time I had really tried PSK on the Raspberry Pi. That I had tried FL Digi first, but it just seemed to be too intensive. And that I'm running Lin PSK, and he was my first contact. So the conversation went on for several more minutes. It was a lot of fun, and it proved that this thing actually works. I was ready to call it a success, and then I checked my email. And I had a message in there from Jim, KH2D, down in Florida. And he said that I had an exceptionally clean-looking signal, but the only problem was he was picking me up on 10 or 12 different places on the band there. So something's just not right, needs a little tweaking yet. You don't want to take over the whole band, though, so I will look into that before getting on the air again. To answer our question, can you work PSK31 on a Raspberry Pi? Definitely. Might take a little experimenting and a little time, but it can be done. It doesn't surprise me that PSK31 actually works on the Pi because uh, I, I wouldn't have thought it was that processor intensive. Well, um, yeah, and looking at the little bar there, you know, showing CPU usage, it was using about half of the, the resources mm. of the machine there. Yeah. Now, the one clue that I got out of there, and I mentioned it, is you've got to put that sound dongle on one of the USB ports on the Raspberry Pi itself. Don't put it on a hub shared with any other devices or it's not going to work. My mouse, man, I mean, I, it took uh, 20 or 30 of these to get it to go from the bottom of the screen to the top. It was so slow. Yeah, that's and, interesting. And I think that maybe I copied one set of call letters while I had it hooked up that way. So. Oh, uh, yeah. That's a great tip, uh, George, because uh, I've been playing around with JT65 uh, on the Pi uh, over here, and I ran into a problem where I was running a, uh, a hub, and I found that the little uh, USB sound card that I was using uh, was a bit unstable. The volume was going up and down, and what you've just told me is possibly the cause. It could have something to do with it. Well, I've got an email here, and this one comes from uh, James. I don't have call letters here, so I'm not sure if he's a ham or not, uh, but it doesn't matter. We, we have both kinds watching the show. Uh, <laughs> he sent a link here to an Instructables. That was pretty interesting. He said he thought we'd get a kick out of seeing this. It's an Arduino project, and it uses uh, a, a regular analog VU meter to make a clock. So he's actually got an analog meter sitting there, and whatever number it's on tells you. Design. What time it is. Oh, that's yeah. cool. Yeah, it was pretty neat. Uh, I've got an email here from Colin, VK5FCJM, and he was just wondering if the Gordon West books are any good for learning the standard ham license here in Australia. 
I can't say I've seen them myself, Colin, but uh, in terms of the general theory, uh, they'd be fine. I suspect, though, that the regulations are a little bit different in the US from what they are in Australia. So uh, you might be better off going to your local uh, ham radio club and uh, taking some lessons there. I don't really know what the best resource is down under. Some of Gordon's books, you know, the, the theory in there is going to be the same because you can't change electronics. But, uh, yeah, the rules and regulations and band plans and such will be different. So if you can find a, uh, a resource for your country, you're, you're probably better off studying that. But it wouldn't hurt to look over Gordon's stuff. It's, uh, it's pretty good. Tommy, what's your next one? Yeah, I've got one here from Joe. KF6ABR. It says, I think it would be great if on one of your shows you could promote Logbook of the World. Announcing ARRL's Logbook of the World. It sure would be nice if we could get more folks using it and it's getting costly to send regular QSL cards. Uh, a lot of people think that it's uh, complicated, but if you could show a segment on how easy it is. Yeah. Yeah. I'm I'm one of a lot of people. It <laughs> it was a little complicated to me. I yeah, I, I looked at it too, and uh, it didn't look all that complicated. But there are several steps, and and it's a good idea for a show, a segment idea. Yeah, so. you, you have to go through and register, and uh, then you have to um, export your data to I believe it's a Cabrillo format or or some special format to upload to them. I I'll be honest, I haven't. Uh, I probably haven't uploaded a log in a year or two now. I'm kind of overdue. So. Yeah, you also you got to get a certificate from A R R L A R. That's a tongue twister. A R R L, uh, authenticity yeah. type certificate. Yeah, and and I think that's where my holdup was. Maybe I submitted over the weekend or something, and it uh, took a a little longer to get it. Yeah, but thanks for the suggestion, Joe. We'll we'll look into doing that possibly in the future. Yeah, and you know uh, MFJs always into uh, different products and things. And we've got an interesting one here we want to talk about this week. Have you ever wished you could take your ham shack with you on the road? Well, now you can. Get on HF, local repeaters, IRLP, Echo Link, and more from any cell phone or laptop. MFJ Enterprises is now the distributor of Remote Shack. The RBC-212 is a remote-based controller equipped with two link ports, one radio control port, and two multifunction ports, each on the auxiliary and RS-232 ports. The Telco Link port allows connectivity from voice over IP services such as Vonage, Magic Jack, AT&T, Comcast, or just a standard telephone line. The audio in-out link port allows connection to any source such as Skype or NFM radio link. Both links can be connected simultaneously for redundancy. With the optional plug-and-play cable kit, Installation is accomplished in minutes with only mic gain to adjust. Simply connect the radio serial and accessory ports to the RVC, then connect a telephone line. Call the telephone number and you're instantly connected to the RVC with your cell phone. And you can connect with Skype if you like. Since both methods are always available, you can pick and choose which method works best for the location you're currently at. Just position the remote shack near your rig, connect a couple of cables, and then follow the easy instructions on setting the menus in your radio, and you're ready to go on the air, no matter where you are. Engineer passcode. Remote base ready. Three, nine, one, six, zero, LSD. All of the uh, different circuits were red lined. You couldn't get lost in it. When you're ready to transmit, just hit a simple command, and you're on the air. Remote Shack comes with a handy reference card that lists all the functions you'll need. So the next time you're on the road and out of the shack, take the shack with you with Remote Shack. From our friends at MFJ, the world leaders in ham radio accessories at MFJEnterprises.com. Yeah, that does look pretty interesting. And it's kind of timely, too, actually, because we're going to be doing a whole episode on remote operation here pretty soon. Uh, we are, and, and that's going to be a lot of fun. And, you know, there's, there's a number of different ways you can operate remotely, and we're going to explore a few of them. Well, Peter, speaking of remote operations, what have you got this month? Well, I, uh, on my recent trip up to New South Wales, I thought I'll, I'll try to leverage the opportunity. And so I dropped in at a place called Tidbin Billa. Now, if you don't know anything about Tidbin Billa, Here's your opportunity.
Well, uh, I'm here with uh, Richard Stevenson from the, uh, what do they call this place, Richard? Uh, it's Canberra Deep Space Communication Complex. Right. Okay, could you tell us a little bit about, uh, we're not actually in Canberra, we're a little ways out, aren't we? We're, yes, geographically, so just a few kilometres away, but so it takes a lot longer by road. Uh, but so, yeah, we're situated just to the west of Canberra uh, in a, a natural valley. Uh, to and uh, there's a reason for that? It is. It, well, originally it was to protect us from, from RF, from, from Canberra itself. Uh, so uh, as the years have gone on, that seems to be uh, less uh, of an impact. Uh, but yeah, so we are where we are. Okay, I noticed a lot of big, well, woks, <laughs> satellite dishes <laughs> outside. Um, I've uh, made a few wok tenors in my time. Uh, but uh, tell us, uh, what are they all for? Well, it's funny because uh, we call them antenna. So if you're from the radio astronomy fraternity, you'd be calling them. <laughs> yeah, so you'd be calling them some telescopes. Uh, but yeah, so we have uh, a 70 metre, uh, so around a couple of 34 metres. Okay. And this, uh, this whole complex is actually uh, operated by. NASA? It's uh, operated by NASA and we're part of the Deep Space Network. Uh, it's one of three uh, sites uh, situated around about 120 degrees apart around the world. We have one in Madrid, uh, the other one in Goldstone, California. And that's about 120 degrees apart, so as the Earth rotates, we can uh, offer 24 hour coverage to most spacecraft projects. Okay, and roughly when was this, uh, this complex set up? Oh, in the late 60s. Uh, obviously, it's, it's washed and waned as far as new antennas, old antennas. Uh, we've uh, decommissioned a couple and uh, we'll, we'll be commissioning another couple in the next couple of years. So, so it's evolving. Okay. And uh, I understand you had some involvement here uh, with Apollo 11. Well, so at the moment we have one of our decommissioned antennas is DSS-46, which is originally uh, from Honeysuckle Creek and was the antenna w which brought down the first pictures of the uh, manned uh, man on the moon. There's this film called The Dish, which our viewers may be familiar with, which sort of seems to suggest that, in fact, there was two-way communication going on out at parks and that uh, they, they received all the signals. But that's not quite correct, is it? No, and I'm sure many Honeysuckle Creek sort of employees will tell you that this wasn't true. <laughs> but no, in fact, so uh, Parks was, was definitely a, a second backup antenna. Mm -hmm. uh, so and, and over the years, Parks has, has, has been been our partners in, in in a lot of projects, including a lot of the Voyager encounters as well. So those first um, uh, famous steps of uh, you know uh, this one step for man, yada yada, by Neil Armstrong, they actually came through Honeysuckle Creek. They came through Honeysuckle Creek uh, through uh, DSS forty six. Uh, forty six was after uh, the manned spaceflight uh, project was was sort of wrapping up, was moved over to Tibbinbilla and was incorporated in from the, the manned space flight to the deep space network as well, where it contributed for a good many, many years. But it didn't stop there, though. You, you've uh, continually been doing um, participating in NASA missions uh, ever since, and in fact, uh, there's quite a famous uh, event just uh, went on here just recently. Oh, this was the, the big MSL launch, uh, and landing, shall I say. So, yes. uh, so the, the landing was certainly uh, one of the milestones uh, so of probably the last few years, and so it was very successful. Yeah, I should mention, uh, where are we actually located within the complex just at the moment? Uh, at the moment, uh, you're uh, in the control room. Uh, so from the control room, all the antennas are controlled, all the communications uh, between here and, and JPL, which essentially manages the, the deep space network for NASA. Uh, and so essentially, I'm sitting in front of one of our, our consoles where uh, we would con control a support for, say, a Voyager uh, for MSL. Uh, so, uh, looking at the schedule, we're coming up for the Mars missions very shortly. Uh, I know you provide communication support, but do you actually give commands to the spacecraft from here? We are probably a, a tunnel between the project and the spacecraft. Uh, we'll pr we provide that communications link between the two. Uh, so, so, we will receive a project command and we will forward it to the spacecraft. About how many staff will we have uh, at this uh, location and uh, you know, are they Australians, Americans? Uh, as to the nationalities, as we're all Australian citizens, uh, so uh, there's just around about 100. Uh, we do have four operations teams as well to provide that 24-7 and so we're, we're about six, six per person, uh, so per team. 
uh, serve to, to cover the uh, cover the time. And um, uh, so, uh, what missions would you currently be involved in at the moment? Uh, it's very much a Mars orientated uh, schedule, especially during the the, the coverage. So we will we'll be tracking Odyssey. Uh, Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, MSL, we're still tracking one of the MERS as well. Uh, we'll we're also tracking some of the, the ESA spacecraft as well, uh, so like they've got Mars Express as well. So, uh, I've been uh, eagerly following the Dawn mission, which has gone to um, uh, Vesta and now going to Sears. Will that come through here as well? It certainly does, yes. Yeah, so, uh, we've, we've tracked so, Dawn from launch, and so each time they extend as well so it, it, it keeps on making it more interesting yeah 2015 is actually going to be quite a busy year for you because not only do you have the sears uh mission uh, arriving uh sorry dawn mission arriving at sears but new horizons will scoot past pluto that year as well so it's going to be a very exciting year well and, and just like a, a landing so for the pluto mission it's, it's going to be a very short take uh, so you either get it right or you don't get it at all the area that we're in, by the way, uh, this isn't normally open to the public. And I, in fact, want to thank you for the privilege of uh, uh, getting to see this because it's something that people don't normally get to, to see at all. Um, now, uh, talking a little bit about the, the dishes out there, uh, you've got, you said you had a 72 metre, was that right? 70 metre. 70 metre. It was originally a 64, uh, so a 64 metre, but so. Uh, uh, probably one of our biggest missions throughout the DSN's life has been Voyager, which was launched in the late 70s. Uh, and of course, as it's been going further and further out, I mean, its uh, planetary missions are now gone and we're just on, on to the, the free space drift. Uh, so we've had to grow the antennas yep. to pick up the, the signals. I mean, now uh, we're down to 160 bits per second on Voyager which is incredibly slow. So if I get this correct, the, the further out you go, um, for a given size antenna, the slower the bit rate, basically. Yeah, well, so I mean, we are still able to support Voyager on the 34 meters, but so, uh, for instance, this morning we had just a tiny bit of rain precipitation, and and that wiped us out. Okay. So the 70 meter gives us a margin. Uh, that raises a good question. What, um, with it, not the specific frequencies, but what bands are you actually using to communicate with these spacecraft? Well, we've actually evolved again, so. If, when you look at the, the Apollo era, we were all, all S-band. Mm -hmm. And S-band is, is still used really be, uh, between Earth and the Moon. Mm -hmm. After that, you start going into the deep space network. And we're trying to drop Sierra band and going into the X-ray band, which is around about the 8 gig range. Mm -hmm. And now we're going up again, so because the X-band is getting a little bit crowded, we're going up into the K-band. So we're looking around about 32 gig. Yeah, my experience at home has been that uh, I've had both C-band and uh, KU-band dishes and uh, when you get the sort of weather we're getting at the moment, which is very uh, overcast and cloudy, the KU-band would drop out, whereas the uh, C-band would be perfectly fine. We're, we have the same thing. S-band is, is robust, yes. yeah, so, but bandwidth is limited. You go into the X-band and... We, ha we hope to have enough margin so it will buffer us from the weather. So mm -hmm. if, it, if it's torrential rain, then there's very little we can do. K-band, you, you can have a cloud and you'll see degradation. And of course the other uh, side of the coin is that for a given size dish, um, if you go up in frequency, you actually get, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, more gain from the same size. Right. So, yeah, so the, 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 the antenna becomes more sensitive. So Because as you go up in frequency, the beam will keep on decreasing. What's the situation like with background noise here? Because camera's not that far away. It's not and uh, over the years we've done many surveys uh, just to see what the impact is and so far we have seen none. So we're very lucky where we are. Yeah, so you don't, uh, the, the, with the growth of uh, Canberra and building out a little bit, it's not uh, slowly no, growing? In fact, so most of our RFI seems to be spacecraft, other spacecraft. I mean, it's getting a little busy uh, sort of in, in a close Earth orbit, and occasionally we'll see the effects of other spacecraft uh, that we're, we're trying to punch through to our spacecraft. Well, I think that just about covers it. Uh, I want to thank uh, Richard and uh, also uh, Glenn uh, uh, for, uh, uh, for entertaining me and uh, showing me around the complex today. Uh, just one final thing, though, uh, Richard. Um, is this place uh, in any way open to visitors to come along and see?
Uh, we certainly have a very active uh, visitor centre, uh, so, so there's certainly lots to see. Uh, so as far as the ops room, maybe not, but you'll get a, a good indication of what we do from the visitor centre. Uh, so there's, there's plenty of information. And uh, I, looking at a map, uh, I did notice also that there was a, uh, a nature park, uh, Tippinbilla, uh, not, not, not far from here. So you can do both in the, in the one day, which is a, a great a great day out. Thanks very much, Richard. Pleasure. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll catch you later. So that was really interesting, Peter. That's like the ultimate in remote operation there. Yeah, the only thing yeah. we've got like that around here is that direct TV dish out there in the front yard. <laughs> <laughs> you, uh, uh, I know that you've got, it's one of three tracking stations around the world, and uh, I believe you've got one over in California and there's one in Spain. Uh, it would be great if perhaps uh, we had a Spanish correspondent who could send in some video of the Spanish one at uh, some stage. But what, what, what I hope came through the, the video was just how big those dishes are. They are incredible. They're like a 15-storey building and uh, people climbing up them or around them are just tiny specks. It's uh, really a massive complex. Yeah, I mean, that was huge. Uh, I, I've never been up to a dish that that big yeah. before. Oh, the other thing I should mention is that um, the places that you saw in that video, such as the main control room, uh, are normally not accessible to the general public. You can only go to the visitor centre. So uh, special thanks to the staff at uh, the tracking centre for letting us have a look at uh, a lot of areas that are normally off limits to the public. Okay. Well, I've got an email here, and this came from Jim, W6RAD, and he said that he's been... Uh, Looking at short antennas, you know, he uh, has problems getting a full-size 80-meter dipole on his lot. And he's looking at the Radio Waves 80DXSH, which is sort of like this right here. This is a DX80, but they make a short model that, uh, what did we say that thing was, Tommy? 77 feet, I think. Yeah, I think so. It, it's got an extra inductor in one of the lines there. And... Um, my opinion on that would be, uh, yeah, if you don't have room for a full-size 80-meter dipole, go for it. I mean, it's going to be better than yeah. than just a piece of wire thrown out there. It, it will be resonant on 80 meters and uh, would probably be a good choice for you. Is that, that agreeable with yeah, you, Tommy? Oh, yeah, definitely. I'd give it a try. Yeah. Uh, Peter, you got a little gift in the email or in the mail, didn't you? Indeed. This, yes, um, I've got a, a letter here from Jim, ZL1LC. He saw Abbott Logic uh, TV episode 50 recently and enjoyed it as usual. However, he was horrified to see uh, me trying to clear a through-plated hole with a needle. And as I didn't have a solder sucker or didn't appear to have one, he enclosed one, um, which I'm very thankful for. Um, that'll come in handy. Uh, thanks, Jim. Don't worry about the cost as I consider it international aid to an undeveloped country. <laughs> be, be warned, Jim, I have many, many sheep jokes. Uh, anyway, please put the needle back in your wife's sewing kit where it belongs. Yeah, you know, Peter, anywhere that they use a needle to poke out a hole through a PC board instead of sucking the solder up with a good old-fashioned solder sucker, that that is a little undeveloped. But, uh, yeah, it's a great little device. Uh, thanks very much. Yeah. You know, Tommy, spring is here, and it's time to take ham radio on the road. ICOM has you covered with mobile options. Check out ICOM's compact, military-rugged 2-meter IC2300H. It's got 65 watts of stable output, and the oversized tuning dial is easy to use. A large, bright alphanumeric display has three backlight options. There's built-in CTCSS and DTCS encode and decode, and incredibly loud 4.5 watts of audio, plus 207 memory channels and multiple scan options. Consider the ICV8000 for your next 2 meter adventure. 75 watts of output, a rugged die cast aluminum chassis, fast memory channel scanning with dynamic memory scan, complete radio control in the palm of your hand with a versatile hand mic, backlight customization, and weather scan alert, an amateur radio first. Taking D-Star on the go is easy with the ICOM entry-level D-Star Ready ID-880H. It's the D-Star rig I use. It has a high 50-watt output with three power settings. 
VHF and UHF dual band functionality, one band at a time, by a simple band switching system. A good memory structure and it's easy to program. There's a large display, backlit buttons and sturdy knobs and lots of memory channels, 1,052 in fact. And there's free programming software available online. I use ICOM's IC2820H. It's D-Star upgradable and GPS capable with the optional UT123 unit. It has 50 watts of output power on both VHF and the UHF bands. True dual watch capability means you can receive two signals simultaneously, even within a single band. There's a one-touch reply function. The large adjustable LCD is great for finding other stations within the band scope function, and features practically multiply with DV mode and GPS. It has GPS alarm and location tracking. Yes, spring is here, and it is time to check out ICOM for your next great mobile adventure. Tommy, you know we've had a, a questions ever so often about how do we put this show together. Yep, we have, and uh, this is your lucky day. It is, isn't uh, it? Yeah, because when we shot uh, episode 50, I brought an extra camera, and we got a little behind-the-scenes footage for you. Today's the day we shoot episode 50. I'm on my way to Georgia's right now, so we can shoot it, and I thought I'd get a little behind-the-scenes footage for you guys while we're at it. <laughs> to communicate with Emil and with Peter, we've been using Skype and recording the streams. Because of bandwidth constraints, we usually do a meal first, and then we'll play that back in context through the rest of the show while we have a live feed from Peter going at the same time with us. Still see it on my back? Uh, just a corner of it now. It's not, not as bad. All I don't right. know if you were about to bump your head on the ceiling or something. <laughs> I'm going to uh, run BlackBerry Flashback. Express, the free version. I probably ought to buy this. I haven't yet, but I use it kind of frequently these days. And I'm going to set it up here to record sound as well as the video. Okay, uh, let's see. I'm going to record sound, and we're going to select a region to record here. Tommy's shooting uh, behind the scenes on how we put this thing together. Episode 50. Woohoo! <laughs> okay, I'm going to start the recorder going. And it should be recording now. And I hope it doesn't stutter this time. I, this doesn't always work that great. But, uh, alright, yeah. I'm going to swap mics and we're going to go back to the. So we won't even be able to see and mail ourselves as we're sitting way back here at the other end of the building. And for me, there's a monitor between me and Emil. Tommy may see him out of the corner there. I right? can see him a little bit. But, uh... Maybe will get a camera and do it the right way. Yes. Okay, so we got to put our headphones in so that we can actually hear what Emil is saying. And these are cheap ones. They're the smallest ones I could find, but Tommy's got some smaller ones. After uh, an hour, these things really get to hurting. And we'll clamp on our microphones. We're using uh, wireless mics, not wireless. We're using lavalier mics here. And these are some that came from Radio Shack years ago. Uh, well, seven years ago when we started Amateur Logic. And uh, they were only like 25 bucks, I think. But they really sound excellent. We've had to do some work on them over the years to keep them going. We originally used some uh, cheap wireless packs with these. And they worked okay for a long time but uh, eventually we started having noise and problems with them so we run pretty much wired all the time now we've got a little PV mixer board down here and this is how we get the audio together we've got uh, our microphones running here uh, we've also got a feed coming from the computer that uh, gives us Skype into here so that we can mix in through the monitor circuit here and I can see he's actually right here. So we've got a little bit of him feeding the camera. And on the monitor, we're feeding a little bit back that goes to the earbuds so that we can hear what's going on. And we're feeding him from the monitor as well. So we've got ourselves up a little bit in there. So all the uh, slide pots here, that's what's feeding the camera. And the monitor row here is what feeds the monitors that we're listening to as, as we're shooting. 
So that way we can we can mix them separately. You don't necessarily have to be listening to the same thing. Yeah, we've also got a little uh, headphone out back here, so everybody can set their own headphone volumes now. Uh, you know, originally we didn't have that, so one person would be blasted out while the other ones could barely hear. But now, you know, we can set our own volume, so that's helped out things quite a bit too. And we've got everything strung under the table here so that we don't get tangled up and fall when, when we have to get up and down. Well, believe it or not, we used a script to try to keep everything in line, timed out, and try to fall within that hour. It's a lot harder than you think to, to make the show within 60 minutes. We've been running over by a couple of minutes every month so far for the last probably six months. It's about time to get hooked up with Peter, make sure everything's good with a connection for him. And we'll take, usually take a few minutes and go through and preview any videos that we may want to discuss on the show. I might use a few more. Well, it helps hold you down. For cameras, we have four. We have two Canon HF M40s and two Canon HF G10s, but we typically shoot with the three you see here now. The 240s are pointed at George and myself for, for the isolated shots, and then we use the G10 for the wide shot that you normally see with us together. All right here, I'm, I'm running on AC power. The battery on this camera would last, but you know, if you leave a camera sitting on pause for long, it shuts down on you. So I'll run this one on AC and it won't shut down. I've got an HDMI cable here that goes to this 32 inch monitor that we use for monitoring ourselves on. I've also got uh, plugged in the external mic input here and in the camera I changed that from mic to line in. I've got a cable that runs over here to the PV mixer and that's how we get our audio in so we're not using the mixer that's or the uh, microphones in the camera. Never do that. That's that's not a good idea. And then right here this is the headphone output of the camera and I've got that run on a cable back here behind the desk just so I can plug my earbuds in and hear what the camera's actually hearing because what we're hearing on the mixer is on a monitor mix and I need confidence to know that what the camera's getting doesn't have a buzz in it and it is good and clear and we can hear everybody yeah. on it. We got bit by that a time or two in the past, haven't uh, we? More than a time or two. Yeah. And and actually we uh, since we have you know it's a stereo uh, camera you know there's two inputs on the camera left and a right what we do is uh, generally I will put my mic say in the left channel and Tommy's mic coming from the mixer only feeds the right channel and then Peter or email or whoever we've got on Skype will mix them in with one or the other of our mics and it'd be nice if we had three or four record channels for audio on these cameras but they only have two so we try to isolate them as much as we can. Then in the, um, in the uh, editing process, we'll go back and pull all these tracks out and go through and I'll cut all the peaks out using uh, Adobe Audition. And uh, I'll go through and if we need noise reduction, I'll put some noise reduction on it. Then I'll put some light compression and limiting on it and mix everything down to mono. And we'll do all that totally separate of the video. We'll just pull the audio away, do all this processing on it. That's the first thing I do. And then we put it back in the editor, line that audio track up with what we got for a video from my cameras. Then I set about editing. Because audios, to me, and I think anyone you ask that does this a lot, audio is just as important, if not more important, than the video of your project as far as how professional it looks when you get finished. Since George has changed his shop and built the green screen that you've seen throughout the video, we have a lot of flexibility. We can put up pretty much any background we want. Normally you see this one that looks kind of like a vent for a piece of gear, but we can put other things back there and take the show where no one's ever gone before. After I get all my video on the timeline, first thing I do is render out the audio track so I can take it and process it in Adobe Audition. You know, Tommy, I missed, really missed seeing him at the ham fest this year, but I think we got him on the line over here. All right. Hey. 
Now here's what the audio track looks like when I get finished with it. I'm not going to bore you with all the details of how I got here because it's a trade secret. But I will tell you basically that I went through first and turned down all the excess peaks in there. Then I went and did a little noise reduction. And finally I did some mild compression limiting on it. Now this will give you a little idea of what the finished audio product looked like. This top line here is the original audio tracks. Now it was split to where I was on this track here at the top. I usually put myself on a separate track since I do most of the hosting and I'm talking the most. And then this second track here has Tommy and Peter and Emil on it. But you can see that these look quite low compared to this bottom track that has been processed and had the noise reduction and all applied to it. So the average level of the sound will be much louder coming through here, but don't overdo that. There's nothing worse than bad sounding audio. As far as video editing software goes, you may recognize what George is using. He's using Sony Vegas Pro on a Windows computer. I use Final Cut Pro 10 on a Mac myself. We don't really have any trouble sending files back and forth, so that's worked out okay. The end result is what really counts. We render out quite a few formats to cover a wide variety of devices. We have a high definition version, a Windows large and a Windows small version, an H.264 version that'll work on your iPod, iPad, things like that, or on your computer. And we also render out just an MP3 file if you want to listen to it only. That was good, Tommy, but, you know, we didn't show them all our trade secrets. No, there's a lot of things we need to keep keep uh, under wraps, but uh, you get a good idea of what, uh, what it takes to put one together. Yeah, um, there's a little more going on before the actual show starts, the preparation and stuff, and all of us shooting our separate uh, segments for the program. But, but basically, you got an idea of uh, what's going on here, and... And as I said, the the room, it looked pretty narrow in, in the video there, but it's actually uh, something about the wide angle. I don't know. Yeah, it's uh, it's pretty spacious in here. we got plenty of room. But, yeah. uh, it's actually like a gymnasium compared to where we used to shoot it. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We were, were practically sitting in each other's laps. We had to sit so close together just to get three people in the frame. Yeah, you remember the one when we were all sitting by that bench with you, me, and Jim, man. We were just like touching Elbow, the shoulders. Yeah. <clears throat> if somebody sneezed, everybody moved. Yeah. <laughs> well, you remember we had a contest back last year um, for Christmas, actually. Mm -hmm. Wow. Congratulations, yeah. Mark. Yeah, congratulations and Merry Christmas, man. You're going to have a nice Christmas. We got to thinking about it the other day, how nice it would be to set somebody up for field day this year. And we talked to our friends at ICOM and at Gigaparts and at MFJ and Heil Sound and said, look, guys, would uh, what do you think about another contest? And they said, that's a great idea. So we, we're about to start another contest. So after you watch the show today, we want you to go to amateurlogic.tv slash contest where you'll find all the rules and regulations and uh, the prizes as well. What's up over there in front of you, Tommy? Man, I've got a nice ICOM IC7200 HF radio. It's uh, olive drab green, but the winner's going to get to pick the color scheme. Yeah, it's uh, available. You know, it's IC7200, and we want to thank ICOM for donating that. And the custom shop paint job is coming from Gigaparts. And, and they're in three different flavors there. You can get the olive drab green if you're a... A World War II uh, enthusiast. If you're a little more Vietnam era, you can get the uh, traditional uh, uh, jungle camouflage. Camo. Mm -hmm. And what's what's the other one? Yeah, the uh, digital uh, desert camo. Yeah, and hopefully we're going to have some of those other rigs in here for you to look at as well, so you can uh, see you know some of the various options that are available there. But the winner is going to get to choose his own paint scheme. And we're going to deliver this to you before field day so that you'll be able to go out and do it in style this year. Uh, what else have we got, Tommy? <clears throat> We've got uh, MFJ's donated a uh, power supply, MFJ 4230MV. 
And that's the same one, that little small one you like so much that yeah, we gave away I, last I really time. I like that. So that'll be nice for field day. Of course, you might want to hook a battery up to the rig, whatever you want. But if you've got AC power, that sure is going to be easy to carry around. And we're also going to have uh, something from Bob at Heil Sound. Not sure exactly what he's sending yet. Maybe it's one of those pro sets. Uh, yeah. Boy, that would be great for field day. Yeah, whatever it is, it's, you know, it's going to be good stuff. It is. And uh, we've got uh, some antennas as well. What's this one over here? We've got a Radio Waves DX80. Um, yeah. Compliments the Gigaparts. No, yeah, compliments the Gigaparts. And, uh, you know, we looked at the, some of the Radio Waves antennas in the last episode. We've also got some antennas coming from MFJ. And there again, we just got this contest together a couple of days before shooting this. So I'm not sure exactly what antennas we'll have from MFJ yet, but uh, it's going to be something nice and portable and multiband. Yeah, multiband. Yeah. Uh, good stuff. Yes, it is. And uh, also, we're going to need some coax for that. Yeah, we got 50 feet of coax from, uh, it's a RG8X coax, uh, compliments of MFJ also. And that's good. And, and they're going to need uh, at least one other thing, aren't they, Tommy? Yep, they're going to need some uh, PL259s to tie the whole thing together. You guys are bleeding me dry, man. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. You, you're worth it. Uh, you get some uh, PL259s from my private stock again. Yeah, uh, you'll actually probably get two of mine, and I'll have to wrench that other one out of him. Hey, I coughed up the other one. It yeah, took well, a few weeks. Where's that stick I had laying around here? <laughs> the BB guns over yeah. here. And we've got, <laughs> yeah, we've got one other thing here that's pretty nice. This is a Masterant uh, synthetic guy rope that Gigaparts is donating. Check that out, Tommy. Do you think a squirrel could chew that? Oh man, he's he'd have a rough time with it. But doesn't that's that pretty, feel? Yeah, that's nice for for such a small diameter. Yeah, it's strong, good good strong stuff. Yeah, like they uh, actually import this. I don't remember uh, what country now. Some European country that this is imported from. And I'm curious, where is it? It doesn't have it on here. But uh, very heavy duty rope. It's lightweight too. Perfect for your antennas. Oh yeah. Oh, it didn't weigh anything. Yeah, you need to throw out that trot line and just get you a roll of that. Well, uh, well let's poison the squirrels. Uh, well, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so how can you uh, enter this contest? Well, first off, we've got a few rules here. You must be a licensed U.S. Sorry, uh, amateur radio operator with a U.S. shipping address. And what else, Tommy? Only one entry per contestant. Sending more than one entry will disqualify the applicant. Yeah, and the winner is responsible for any taxes that might be incurred, mm -hmm. as with most contests. Yep, the winner agrees to use his call, his or her call, rather, in uh, any promotional and news items related to the contest. Yeah, and the uh, contestants cannot be employees or affiliates of AmateurLogic.tv. ICOM America, MFJ Enterprises, Gigaparts, or Heil Sound. So that cuts us out again. Yeah, I tried quitting last time for a month, but that didn't work out. No, it didn't. And that's why Jim <coughs> quit, you know, but he didn't win. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, how do they enter? Uh, you need to send an email to fielddaycontest at amateurlogic.tv. Send your call sign in the subject line. Include your name, call sign, class of license, and your address in the email body of the message. Yeah, only your call sign and the subject line so that we can sort through these easy and make sure we don't have duplicate entries in there. And the winner is going to be selected by a random number drawing of all the entries we receive. And it's going to be announced on the June 15th episode of AmateurLogic.tv. Now, we're actually going to uh, draw this on, uh, on June 8th because that's probably when we will mm -hmm. shoot the show. And we want to make sure that uh, we've already selected the winner and that they can choose their scheme of paint job for that radio and it gets shipped to them by field day. So, and if, uh, if for some reason it's determined that the winning entry was not qualified, then we'll just choose another one randomly. Mm -hmm. For all the contest rules and information, go to www.amateurlogic.tv slash contests. Yeah, and it's pretty exciting. It's it uh, some great prizes, and I really appreciate the uh, everyone that's donating those. Yeah, ICOM, uh, 
Giga Parts, MFJ, and Hile Sound. And great package for someone other than us. We got to lose two PL 259s in the deal. Yeah, well, we're going to Dayton, so I just have to get some extra ones. There you go. <laughs> What's next on your email stack, Tommy? And I've got one email left somewhere. Here, Sorry. take mine. I've got it. <laughs> uh, I've got it. This one's actually not from a ham. This is from a uh, guy over at Twit, Brian, mm -hmm. at twit.tv. He's our uh, technical director for yeah. uh, Ham Nation. Yeah. Uh, anyway, he says he just heard about this app today called iCircuit. It lets you simulate digital and analog circuits. Thought you might find it interesting or even feature it on the show. And uh, the URL is www.icircuitapp.com. And uh, I actually played around with that when I was doing the little uh, uh, fox hunt transmitter. Mm -hmm. I, I was looking for something to put a schematic together, and I downloaded it and played with it. It's pretty nice. It was way overkill for what I needed at the time but you guys go check it out i think you'll find it interesting yeah i, I looked at it too I, I believe when it came out and it uh i don't know it really wasn't tailored for the type of thing i do so i i didn't download it but uh, it does look like a nice program if you uh you know want to do it on your eye device mm -hmm. oh yeah. it uh, runs on your computer as well oh it or, does or, yeah computer android tablet um yeah okay a lot of different a lot of different flavors and I have one final email here, and this one comes from Chris. And I don't have his call sign here. But uh, he said he just wanted to pass along a note that he started watching a few episodes uh, via Roku. And he really liked what he was seeing us do with the Raspberry Pi. And uh, he said he followed my lead with the uh, 4x4 electrical box that I built my Pi in. You saw it yeah. earlier. Yeah. Yeah. And... Uh, he did a nice one here, but he did it a little different. He made him a template with a draft site 2D CAD, and he mapped everything out ahead of time and then cut his holes. And uh, boy, isn't this a great looking one here? This is much better oh, that's <laughs> than, clean right there. than my that's, job. Yeah. That's nice. And he said he did find out that the hot knife worked better than anything else as far as for cutting the straight lines and all. Hmm. So, uh, looks like I started something there. Well, congrats, Chris. That's a. Uh, a very good-looking Raspberry Pi yeah. case there. If, uh, and, Chris, if you watch a few more times, if you're not a ham, you will be. Yes. Yes, you will. <laughs> <laughs> and that about does it, uh, <clears throat> Tommy. Have we got a net this month? We do. It's going to be the Monday following the release, and I believe the 15th is on a Monday. It is. So it'll be the following Monday. So, uh, anyway, we'll post it in the Facebook group and on Twitter and the usual places for reminders. Yeah. Uh, Google Plus. And so you just covered two other things, on, three other things on my list here. Well, I'm <laughs> just a, trying to rush us on out the door. Yeah. Uh, the Facebook <laughs> group, uh, search for Amateur Logic on Facebook. We've got a great group of uh, a few thousand hams on there, and we're always sharing tips and technical information and, and general uh, junk. I mean, just whatever anybody thinks yeah. about. You oh, know. But it's, it's good junk, man. It, it's, it's the a, best it's junk, yeah. So uh, you want to check that out. Uh, you want to follow Amateur Logic on Twitter, too, to get all the updates on what's going on. And on the Google Plus uh, communities there, we have Amateur Logic community now. It's starting to get a little traction. Yeah, it's, uh, it's picking up, and uh, there are actually some pretty funny, uh, <laughs> yeah. there's, uh, some pretty funny uh, pictures uh, with our faces uh, pasted in them. So check those out. Uh, anyway, yeah. it's, uh, it's kind of a riot. And tell all your friends about Amateur Logic and the various ways you can watch it. You can download it from AmateurLogic.tv. You can watch us on YouTube. Uh, you can watch us on the Roku. Uh, you can get it from iTunes as well. And there's probably two or three other ways. Yeah, I didn't you think can about. Uh, watch it on Apple TV under the podcast section. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we're we're everywhere. And don't forget about the Amateur Logic Wiki. Yep, uh, AmateurLogic.tv slash Wiki. And uh, you'll find all the show notes there, all the links, uh, all that good stuff. Yep. And uh, again, thanks to uh, Dan, N9LVS. I think last month we called him N5. Uh, sorry about that, Dan. Yeah, it's hard to do. We're trying to make you an honorary Southerner. But, yeah. <laughs> uh, anyway, Dan, thanks for that. And uh, thanks, everyone, for watching. Another fun show, as always. And uh, there should have been something in this one for just about everybody. We kind of really covered a lot of territory. 
Yeah, yeah. I, would, uh, I think people are going to like to see the behind-the-scenes thing. Oh, the whole show looks like a good one, but there were a lot of requests for that. I was surprised how many people wanted to see yeah. it. Well, any final words from down under, Peter? No, um, uh, but uh, just uh, everybody have a great, uh, well, we've just had Easter, but um, yeah, I suppose it's all back to work and uh, we'll be working on our next episode. Okay. okay. Sounds good. Yeah. Live long and prosper. Live long and prosper. <laughs> nanu, nanu. <laughs> 73. Yeah. Well, Peter, speaking of remote operations, what have you got this month? Uh, what if, oh, you're talking about my segment. I did it right. I thought I screwed it up, man. I thought I had them backwards. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I mean, I had yeah, it right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Right. Take 17. And that's a wrap. <gasps>